and welcome to all skeptics in the hubbers wherever you are let me just stop my laptop from going mad and tonight as you've no, as you already know because it's been heavily publicized we have a really good skeptical area to deal with homeopathy complementary and alternative medicine and we have a real guest who's an expert in that field but before i introduce him I'm going to introduce some of our earlier friends. Now we've had Richard on the show before. Hello, Richard. Good evening to you all. How the devil are you? Well, I'm fine, I'm locked down. I'm now on steroids for polymyalgia rheumatica for which I do not take homeopathy. And so I am technically vulnerable and have to be a bit careful. Yes, yes. Well, we're all socially distanced. I think you're probably about 100 miles away. And uh, my next guest is uh, the nearest to me. He's uh, probably just a few, a 10 or a few teens of miles away. Hello, Max. Have you got frozen, Max? Oh, dear. Ah, hello, Max. Hello. Good. Hello. Good. How the, how the devil are you? I'm very well, thank you. I'm um, not socially distancing more than is absolutely necessary, but I am a bit a bit um, rigorous about wearing masks whenever I'm out in any shop. Yes, yes, I've got some masks too. The only problem I have is remembering. Oh, we've got a chroma key interesting is happening going on there. Uh, okay. The only problem I have is remembering to put them on. But there, when you get to my age... What do you yeah, expect? That it, it's the frustration when you're wearing the mask and nobody else is, which um, makes it all slightly pointless because it's about protecting other people. But they, yes. yes, yes, yes. But our star guest tonight is all the way over in Cambridge. Hello, Edzard. Hi. How the devil are you? I'm all right. I'm in quarantine in Cambridge, as, as you said. Mm -hmm. uh, I came in from France about a week ago. Um, I, I had left for France in February already, not knowing what was going, going to happen. And mm -hmm. when I saw the absolute chaos that uh, our government had, was creating with uh, COVID, I decided to stay. Then I looked at my passport and realized it was running out. So I had to come back. And I'm hoping to renew my passport and then flee the country again. Can I, can I just say, as a, if you can, leave your... Is it a British passport or an EU or German passport? No, it's, it's, uh, it, it's a British passport. Well, if you wait a little longer, maybe till August, you'll get a blue one. <laughs> Apparently, they're already blue. Some of them are, some but not all. Not, not all, the they're still getting rid of some of the old stock, so you could be unlucky. Uh -huh. That will make all the difference, won't it? The colour of it. <clears throat> yeah. make it all makes Brexit totally worthwhile. Yes. yes. Oh, dear. <laughs> what a mess we're in. Eh? Uh, anyway, the, the point of this evening is to talk about yeah. complementary and alternative medicine, or CAM for short. And Edzard, you've got a very interesting history on this subject area, haven't you? And I know that Max has got some questions that he would like to ask you. And I'm sure Richard will have plenty to say. That's good. that's for certain. <laughs> so and I'm going to I'm going to leave you two together, Edzard and Max, to uh, talk amongst yourselves for a bit and uh, Richard and I will come back later. How's that? Okay. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. Um, do, do we do we have a safe word when we need need you to come in and um, sort it out? <laughs> I'll be watching. Don't worry. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Well, thanks, Edzard. I was going to start off then by just asking if you could briefly explain to us your journey, because as I understand it, and I got my information from Wikipedia, so my apologies if it's completely wrong is that you trained in Austria or Germany? Germany. You trained in Germany. As part of your training, it included elements of complementary medicine. Yeah. Uh, yeah. My, my, my story with uh, alternative medicine begins earlier. Um, 
I, our family doctor was one of Germany's most prominent homeopaths. So I grew up with homeopathy in, in a way. And when I studied medicine, uh, homeopathy was just medicine for me. There was no difference. Um, it was only when the pharmacologists uh, exploded with bad temper when they heard about uh, or when, when homeopathy was mentioned that I realized it was quite quite di different. And then by complete coincidence when when I was um, when I had finished my studies, um, I, I got a job in the only homeopathic hospital which uh, at the time was in Munich still exists. And, and this is where I learned homeopathy. Uh, I've, I've, I've never had any formal training in, in homeopathy, but I, I learned it uh, on the, by the bedside, so to speak. Um, and then once I had left this hospital, uh, I became a, quite a normal doctor, uh, went through the usual clinical training, and then decided to have a career change. I went to London and was trained to become a scientist. I, I did a PhD in, in some basic science subject and I was, uh, it, it, it made me rethink just about everything I knew about medicine. Eventually I returned into clinical medicine, um, um, became a professor of physical medicine and rehabilitation first in Hanover and then was appointed chair of physical medicine and rehabilitation in Vienna. Um, and as such, I often remembered uh, my time in alternative medicine, which in a way had fascinated me. And I did a few studies here and then when, whenever the uh, occasion was right. And I got thoroughly fed up with uh, with Vienna, uh, even though this was a life post and, and money was no object, that sort of thing. But uh, it's a long story anyway, and it has nothing to do with alternative medicine. I was fed up, uh, and I was looking at the at the new scientist, um, reading it from cover to cover, seeing an advertisement that the University of Exeter was looking for uh, a professor in complementary medicine. I applied and after some wrangling I got the post and um, built up a team, did some research and that's basically it. Okay, can I just just add to that? You talked about you know how you had to leave Vienna uh, my understanding is that actually you did some research into the history of the hospital during the war um, and which suggested that many of the staff had not behaved honourably in relation to particularly to some of the Jewish staff, but possibly to others. And that caused some tensions. Yeah, many, it seems to me your ability to fight for truth. Um, you've shown it in a number of places and that appears to be one of them. I thought it worth mentioning as a sign of how you don't shrink from a challenge. Yes, it, uh, the, the story very briefly was that my department in, in Vienna was the first to um, move into a mega new hospital and uh, this was a very big event for Austria with uh, all sorts of speeches, uh, television and all, all of that. And I was supposed to give a, a little speech. And in, in preparation, I thought, what better than research the history of my own department, which was a big mistake. <laughs> and, and, and I stumbled over all sorts of really, really horrible things, which eventually I, I published. Uh, by the way, that's what I call the most important publication of my life. Um, um, and, uh, and in the course of that, um, I became very, very uncomfortable in Vienna and left. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you. 
Um, as I say, the message for me is about how you know you don't shy away from a from from the truth and the struggle. So you went to Exeter, and I, I've read somewhere that part your part of your aim when you went to Exeter was to use the science that you learned to demonstrate the effectiveness of complementary medicine. Is that the, is that so? Yeah, that 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 basically basically was my remit. To um, uh, I stopped being a clinician. I, we we ne we never had patients outside clinical trials. Uh, I built up a team, a multidisciplinary team, and my remit was to research alternative medicine. So that, that is very, very broad remit for, for me. This meant. Uh, testing treatments in terms of efficacy and more importantly perhaps uh, finding out what the risks of alternative medicine are so that's what that's basically what what we did um, uh, and it went swimmingly for quite a while uh, my peers in Exeter were actually quite proud because we were we were extremely productive and and very visible uh, with the press, etc. Um, until uh, a certain Charles Windsor uh, complained about us. But, but by which you mean our delightful Prince Charles? Yes. Yeah, and uh, that caused. Uh, uh, a horrendous investigation of my own university uh, into 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 my behavior in in a, in one particular instance, uh, my own university, which of course should have protected me from such assaults. Um, Thirteen months of hell, uh, during which every support broke down. My staff was dismissed. Contracts were not prolonged. At the end, I was found not guilty as charged, uh, uh, but everything had broken down, and I I went into retirement. Although it hasn't been a quiet retirement for you, has it really? Can you? No, in a way, still, you're still heavily writing on the subject and heavily in, engaged. In a way, re retirement was was a relief because nobody was breathing down my neck anymore and I, I could actually do what what I wanted albeit much much slower because when you used to to have a team of 20 people working with you and for you things get much slower but I was able to to publish a few books um, and practically no uh, original research anymore because uh, the team is missing um, but uh, still quite a few publications, uh, books, lectures, and a blog, which I, which, which I um, like a lot and which is very lively and where I publish almost every day a new article. I mean, as I, you went from being the, the new professor in Exeter, researching complementary medicine, presumably with having trained in homeopathy and having been treated by homeopathy in your youth with quite an open mind and quite a positive approach to it. I hope I'm not, it would, would that be a fair way of describing your starting yeah, point? Yeah, and, and most definitely. Um, as a scientist, I, I was aware that I, I should and must leave all my uh, uh, likings and dislikings uh, uh, behind and try to do as objective as possible research into alternative medicine but um, emotionally if if anything i was slightly in favor of um, of all this stuff and i i forgot to mention that the the chair was funded by sir morris lang who 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 was very much in favor. Uh, so th this was all set up to, to be positive for alternative medicine. And, and for a few months, uh, the alternative medicine brigade in, in the UK was delighted with me until I put my first pen to paper and 
uh, told them what I really intended to do. And one thing they couldn't understand at all was why was I interested in safety? Surely they said safety is not a subject that relates to alternative medicine because alternative medicine doesn't carry any risk at all. If if I wanted to study uh, side effects and risk, I ought to study the side effects and risk of medication, mainstream medication. Um, and um, it turned out not to be at all true because practically all alternative treatments are associated with certain risks, some with quite significant risks. Okay, I mean, can you maybe describe some of those risks? I must admit, you know, I, they're not something that would immediately spring to my mind thinking about the risks of it. So perhaps you, could you expand on that a bit for us? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll start with the, with, with the most harmful, so to speak, alternative medicine, um, homeopathy. There's nothing in the medicine, so it cannot cause any harm. So the homeopathic remedy is totally harmless, uh, but the homeopath isn't harmless, obviously. Uh, so uh, as the remedy is prescribed by a, by a, a practitioner, you cannot say that homeopathy is harmless. Uh, it's not harmless because they, they treat serious diseases with placebos. It's not harmless because they advise uh, against taking uh, conventional medicine. Best researched is um, vaccinations, which is, is, is a good subject at, at present. They, they tend to be uh, against vaccinations and uh, not 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 even just that, but they also advise patients to take homeopathic vaccinations, which are uh, next to useless. Th this is this is one where one treatment where I say um, th there are large indirect risks, no direct risks. Another treatment which is associated with very direct risk is uh, chiropractic. Uh, if chiropractors manipulate your upper spine, um, your vertebral artery is in danger of breaking up, you know, dissecting. And when that happens, uh, you have a stroke. Uh, and when you have a stroke, you can die. About five, 500 cases reported in the, in the medical literature. But one has to say that there's no reporting scheme like we have in con conventional medicine. So we can uh, only guess that uh, th these 500 cases might be the tip of, of a much, much bigger iceberg. Can I interrupt there? Because you've mentioned the word placebo, and I know that Richard is a, he moonlights as a charlatan. <laughs> he makes use, makes use of the placebo effect. Because So could you say something about placebo, Richard. You'll have to unmute yourself first. Uh, well, placebo, is, as we all know, I think we all know, it c comes from the Latin, I will please. And I think that's a, an important concept. We're dealing with patients. The word patient comes from the Latin for suffering, people who suffer. And, and these folks, they are suffering in the sense that they believe they have a disease. Perhaps they do have a disease. Uh, they certainly have feelings which are not assuaged by regular orthodox or conventional medicine and they need help and I, I think we all have sympathy I know it Ernst does has sympathy for them the problem is they are steered by chemistry as I call it or scams as as Ernst calls it uh, they're steered in the wrong direction they get the wrong idea they come to believe strange things or strange to us but rational to them uh, and they get stuck in this mode of desire and wish to be happy, to be content, to have pain settled, to have their emotional status settled. And although one shouldn't really talk about patients live on air, I'm prepared to say that is the problem with Prince Charles. He's a bit of an emotional problem. He resolves many of his emotional problems by taking placebos. 
They're called homeopathic remedies. We don't know who is treating him nowadays. Peter Fisher did, but sadly, Peter was uh, killed in a bike accident a couple of years ago. Peter was the uh, homeopath to the royal family. And um, Prince Charles finds a great deal of comfort uh, from homeopathy, which is fine. And the reason I mention a patient, which as a doctor one generally shouldn't, it is because Prince Charles has chosen to put this matter in the public domain. If he'd have just quietly gone about his business like his mother does and uh, taken his uh, remedies as and when he felt the need, I would say nothing more about it. But the fact is, he has become the patron of the homeopathic society. He promotes the idea. He speaks out and he acts to promote these strange treatments of all sorts. But homeopathy is the most famous, which we're talking about at the moment. I, I think placebo is a useful tool. As Ernst, uh, or as Ard, as we're now going to call it, uh, Professor Ernst, um, we have a slight disagreement, which we have never aired personally before. Uh, I think that placebos help, and I believe Edzard would say that they themselves have a danger because they fool pe patients. They mean that you've got to be dishonest as a doctor if you give them to patients. You've got to say, take this pink medicine, it'll make you feel better. But that's actually a true statement. It will make you feel better. I think the trick resides with consent. All doctors should take informed consent before treating patients and all healthcare workers, nurses and everybody else. And if you're going to use a placebo, then you need to tell folks, look, this is a placebo. That is to say, there is no evidence available to the scientific medical community that the remedy I'm about to provide you with through my prescription has any effect on any pathological process. However, the mere fact of taking it might make you feel better. And if you would like to try and see what happens, then I'm prepared to prescribe you this placebo. Now, we do have some research, and I just wish Ernst had been, uh, sorry, uh, Professor, I'm so used to calling you Professor Ernst. Uh, I do wish Edzard had, Edzard had been around long enough to do research in this area himself, but uh, there are others who, uh, Irving Kirsch most notably, who have done research in this area and have shown, at least to my satisfaction, that if patients are told that they are about to have a placebo, there is still an effect above, if you like, a placebo that they haven't been told about. So uh, it's strange that patients should know that there is a placebo, but it works. Now, the thing is, John and uh, the rest of you, I'm also a magician. I'm a member of the Magic Circle, and one of my hobbies, apart from playing drums that we've just discussed with Ezra, is, uh, is, is magic. And it is quite remarkable. I can do an effect, and very often I will tell people pretty much how it's done, never exactly, and they just won't believe me. They'll, they'll, they'll actually almost prefer to believe magic uh, or that I possess quite amazing skills, which I do not. I'm using some trick process. But people just are more comfortable. They, they feel more satisfied if, oh, well, Richard's got a, a quite amazing abilities. Um, and they just feel more comfortable that way. And I think it's the same with, with placebos in medicine. Uh, people just feel comfortable to be taking placebos. So I'm okay about patients taking placebos, but I do accept um, Ezard's uh, concern. They don't last very long. They're totally unpredictable whether they work at all in any individual patient. Uh, but I just don't, I think that doesn't matter. If a patient feels comfortable to take them and the secret is gives consent to taking a known placebo, then I'd be comfortable with that. So it's ethical as long as you to prescribe them, as long as you make them aware that they're getting something which is actually uh, untested. Sure. Uh, yes, I, I, need, I need a haircut. I'm going to have a haircut in a. It's, it's a month to get in to see my chap, uh, and uh, I'm going to feel better. I mean, people feel better after a haircut, after having a little bit of perfume. All sorts of things make you feel better and satisfy you in one way or another. If you get a little bit more serious problem, you may need to see a psychotherapist and have some serious work. Uh, and placebo sits sort of between those two extremes. Yeah. Well. Perfume is fine if you're healthy, but can offering we, can we, if we placebo effect, can we can we just then perhaps think about something like acupuncture? 
which clearly you can understand how acupuncture might have a big placebo effect because it's so visible and so dramatic. But I believe, Edzard, that actually some of your work showed that some acupuncture is actually quite effective. And I'm struggling with that balance between acupuncture being effective in some cases, but by and large being placebo. I'm wondering if that's something you could sort of tell us about. If, if I may, I, I first go back to the to the placebo. Two two points. Um, if uh, Richard is 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 correct, you 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 need informed consent under all circumstances. So um, le let's say I I give I I propose homeopathy to a patient, and I, I say there's nothing in it. Uh, so it is not plausible. Uh, there are 500 trials which collectively do not show that it works, but take it anyway because uh, it might it might help you uh, via placebo effect. Now, uh, no sane patient would would go on and take it, uh, except maybe Prince Charles. Um, in 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 other words. Uh, Informed consent doesn't happen. The second point uh, is is more important, I, I think. Um, placebo is good, and we use it all the time in proper medicine. Uh, but we don't need a placebo in order to generate a placebo effect. If if we administer an, an effective treatment with empathy, compassion, etc. We generate a placebo effect, no doubt, plus the specific effect of the of the treatment. In other words, giving just a placebo, just a homeopathy uh, treatment, uh, for instance, is cheating the patient out of something that is mightily important uh, for his uh, recovery, namely the specific effect of the treatment. And this is why giving a placebo is not ethical. Now, uh, uh, acupuncture. Your, 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 your question, Max, was about ac acupuncture. The, the evidence is very, very mixed and very, very unreliable. Um, the, the majority of, of the trials in acupuncture come from China. We know that not a single trial of acupuncture from China is ever negative. Whether you uh, have a trial for penis enlargement, hair growth, or acne, it's it's always positive, meaning that these trials are not uh, reliable. We also know that in uh, Chinese research, uh, um, cheating is rife. Um, and uh, that makes it even less reliable. So the the evidence on acupuncture is mixed and not very reliable. Uh, and and you're right in in some indications it might actually do something, uh, particularly for pain, which is uh, funny because uh, in traditional Chinese medicine pain was not by, by any. Um, means the indication for acupuncture. Uh, in, in TCM, uh, traditional Chinese medicine, it's used for everything. It's a cure-all. It's supposed to rebalance the two life forces uh, and an imbalance of these two life forces makes you ill and therefore every illness can be cured by acupuncture. So I, now I forgot your question about acupuncture. My question was, I read again, it was on Wikipedia, so I might be wrong, that in one of your lists of the few things that complementary medicine does seem to work for, you included, I think, acupuncture for nausea is one of the things it appears to work for. Yeah. Um, in there, wondering... The evidence is, is now a little bit weaker. Um, what what happens usually with acupuncture then you you have a bulk of uh, 20 trials or so um, uh, and and the meta analysis of these trials uh, published even as a cochrane review 
uh, and and people say, look, there's even a Cochrane review, and, and it shows it works for nausea. Then some uh, real scientists uh, um, go into the subject, do some proper trials, not in China, and uh, sort of dismiss uh, the the previously positive evidence or dilute the positive evidence and the more of these proper trials emerge the the the, the weaker the totality of the evidence becomes so um i've i've just recently looked at at the current evidence for acupuncture and it seems to work at present according to cochrane reviews only for the prevention of tension type headache and migraines that's all but well, if it, it has a little effect how does that work if we're saying that by and large it's a placebo issue so you say that again but that's implying it has a real clinical effect which you wouldn't say about homeopathy i'm sure so i'm just wondering how is that if it has a real clinical effect Sorry, I suspect I'm mouthing the words of some of my um, odd colleagues who um, live in Glastonbury and propose alternative medicine for most things. Um, and that could be if it, if it does work for one thing, why couldn't it work for other things? Well, I'm not sure it works for anything. I, 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 I have just finished that that review of Cochrane reviews, and and according to Cochrane reviews, it. It, it doesn't cure anything, it doesn't treat anything, but it it seems to prevent tension type headache and migraine. That's all. And 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 I've tried to explain how unreliable the evidence is, so I would take that with a lot of pinches of salt. Uh, and I'm 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 not sure it, it works, but if your question was how does it work? Well, there, there are theories about about this. Uh, it used to be gate control theory, then uh, uh, various uh, neurophysiological th theories that that might explain how it works. It certainly doesn't work via uh, rebalancing yin and yang, as the TCM people believe. But but there are some credible theories as to how it works. Generally speaking. When people say homeopathy, acupuncture, so working mechanism, there usually is interesting research, but I, I don't find it that fascinating because for me, as an ex-clinician, I first want to see that it works and then I might get interested into the mechanism because if it doesn't work, uh, who cares about the mechanism? <laughs> if it does work, Surely it's only as a result of its theatricality sticking pins in you. And therefore, shouldn't more theatricality, like, I don't know, sawing a, a finger off, make it work better? Well, I, sh I, sh I should mention that uh, that is not an excellent argument because there are uh, pretty good placebos now for... for uh, acupuncture we have developed one which is basically a stage dagger a miniature stage dagger and it looks as though it it, it goes into the skin but it, it just shortens yes. uh, uh, and 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 we had a phd student from from korea who developed that and uh, it's it's properly validated and so forth and if you if you do trials with 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 those devices, uh, the effect almost completely disappears. Oh, how interesting. <laughs> now, you also wrote a book, didn't you, in collaboration with Simon Singh. How did that come about? Well, that's a nice story. Um, I, I was asked to be uh, uh, the advisor to, to a, a medical program of the BBC presented by Cathy Sykes, uh, and it was in, in four parts, and one part was entirely on acupuncture, and I, I, I advised them, uh, helped them, corrected some obvious mistakes and so forth, and when, when it was broadcast, the opening scene 
was in, in China, operating theater in China, and Cathy Sykes was standing there and, and, and said, oh, I can't believe it. There, there is there's a young woman being uh, operated open heart surgery and and all she has uh, for anesthesia is acupuncture isn't it marvelous isn't isn't it sensational well um, simon and 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 the rest of the world saw this and and we all saw that it wasn't at all sensational she had all sorts of lines going in, into her, and Simon did a bit of research, and and was was getting more and more angry, and phoned me up. And uh, I, I, I had never heard of Simon Singh before, and and said, "How do you dare, um, being the medical advisor? How do you dare calling yourself an expert? Expert if if that sort of thing is being broadcast." What he didn't know is that my advice was solely on the text. So I, I, I corrected the text that Cassie Sykes was was saying. So I had seen the text, but not the the, the pictures. I, I didn't know that the patient had all sorts of stuff going into her. So Simon said, "Let's let's complain. Uh, are you game?" And and I supported his complaint, and and it went into. Uh, two instances, and and finally he, he it was upheld, and Simon quite liked uh, the the way I handled this, and I quite liked Simon, and, and one day he came and said, "Let's do a book together," and I said, "No way, no way! You're a physicist, uh, and and you understand nothing about medicine, and um, th this will be terrible." Uh, and he, but he insisted, and he said, "Let's let's at least try a chapter." We tried a chapter, and actually, it was great fun, because him being a physicist, I had to go back to all the first assumptions. He asked very clever questions because he's a clever chap, and and I had to to rethink all my own assumptions and and so forth. So it it, it was a learning process for me too. And then uh, we did that book together, and and it it was quite successful, uh, translated into twenty languages, I think, um, except for the fact that he got sued while advertising it in in the Guardian um, by the British Chiropractic Association, and and that developed into a big big story, uh, in the course of which he he altered um, libel law in in this country, which. Uh, is incredible. I mean, Simon is just incredible. Yes, he had some lawyers back him, didn't he, on pro bono? Uh, no, 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 no. He 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 had to pay two hundred thousand pounds for it. Oh yes, but the Guardian covered it. That's what I'm thinking. No, 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 no. The um, Guardian the Guardian dropped him like a hot potato. Oh. So, so did the book publisher. I at, at our last meeting before publication, at the office of the book publisher, I, I said, uh, "We are going gonna get sued." I thought we are gonna be sued by the by the homeopaths, oh. uh, but we we did get sued by by the chiropractors, and and our contact at the publisher said, "No worries. First, we had it read by lawyers the, the book." Uh, and and secondly, um, if you do get sued, we will protect you. They also dropped him like a hot potato. He was on his own. I I helped him the best I could because he was sued personally uh, mm. because of his gar Guardian article, uh, mm. and and I think they probably wanted to get at me, but uh, because Simon and chiropractic hadn't 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 come up on the radar before so they 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 wanted to get at me probably uh, but they got him and and it was a long process uh, and and he won and uh, the chiropractic association had to pay his costs most of it but uh, he, he was still uh, 50000 pounds out of pocket Ooh, that's serious money you know, uh, chaps, I'm going to have to put some questions up, otherwise our viewers will be 
a bit miffed if they're not having their input addressed. So take a look at this one. Conrad wants to know how it ever came about that homeopathy could have been considered to be part of proper medicine, genuine medicine, and prescribed. It, it seems like a mismatch to him. Yeah, uh, when the, uh, the the question is probably about about um, Britain, about England, when when the uh, NHS was created, all alternatives were declared outside uh, the NHS, except for homeopathy. And, and, and the reason I was given for, for it uh, was that uh, it was because of royal protection. Uh, as, as, as long as homeopathy exists almost, the royal families of Great Britain uh, have been enthused by it, so they they probably protected it, and it it came into in into the realm of what the NHS was doing. Yeah. In other country, in other countries, Germany, for instance, it never was outside. Uh, the Nazis were great fans of homeopathy, uh, um, and. Uh, actually conducted the, the largest series of experiments on homeopathy uh, even to date. Uh, the results of which all were negative, but uh, the results also disappeared in the hands of, of the homeopaths. So we only have hearsay for that. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a tale. So we have... Uh... Another one here from Conrad, by the way, is in Canada. So I don't know whether he is familiar with our NHS history. So here's somebody who's had a success with, with homeopathy and acupuncture. What do you think? Well, there are many answers to that. Uh, why, why, why do you think the the effect disappears once you control for all the variables and the biases and the confounders? Uh, they 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 disappear because the effect relies on uh, all sorts of other factors other than the uh, specific effect of homeopathy, for instance. For instance, uh, placebo we, we have talked about, but there, there are other things like regression towards the mean, uh, the natural history of the disease, um, and, and, and so forth. So, so um, anecdotes, personal experiences and such are not evidence. Uh, nobody can be fooled easier than yourself. Uh, and 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 that's it. That is what it what what boils down to. Oh, oh. Yes, uh, one of my heroes, the deceased physicist, said that um, you're the easiest person to fool. But the human body is remarkable, isn't it? We get better anyway, <laughs> very often. And if if we like to attribute that to some event, some treatment, some homeopathy or whatever, that doesn't mean that there is actually a cause and effect relationship. No. Uh, two things related in time are, are not necessarily causally rela related. If, if, the, if the, uh, uh, the cock crows in the morning, uh, it doesn't make the sun come up. Uh, it's the other way around. So causality is is often difficult to, to establish, and the best way we have to establish it in medicine is through a proper clinical trial. And if, if the clinical trials show that something doesn't work, I would rather trust the clinical trial than even my own experience. I, I too, uh, got better on homeopathy. Uh, 
because uh, I was young and I got better anyway. Yes, Richard's got a contribution to make here. You, you need to unmute, Richard. I, when I give my much acclaimed lecture on these subjects, I've got a slide which shows 99.9% .9 correlation, absolute correlation over a 10-year period between the ingestion of margarine in Massachusetts in the United States and the divorce rate. <laughs> and if you go on internet, you can any one of your viewers now can take five seconds out, go on the internet. There are dozens of strange anomalous correlations. It yeah. just reinforces the point. We all know that correlation does not apply association. Turning to Conrad, I think I'm the only person here this evening who has actually operated on a trapped nerve with success to relieve it, the pressure on the nerve on a number of occasions, most usually due to a disc, sometimes due to an overgrowth of bone in the area where the nerve passes through the spine. Theoretically, it could be a cancerous growth. I never dealt with cancer personally, but colleagues do. So Conrad, the thing about your back is that, um, first of all, what was the diagnosis? You say it was a trapped nerve. What was trapping it? How long it had been trapping it? Uh, what, what could be done about it if it was a disc pressing against the nerve? There is no conceivable, and I can't believe, Conrad, even you can conceive of any methodology whereby a, a, a needle or a series of needles uh, just under your skin would possibly relieve pressure on a nerve in your back. Now, that's been your experience that you had some acupuncture and you got better. But have we, as we've said, uh, that could just be, in fact, I would suggest, is a coincidence. So the interesting thing, the question that Conrad will have to answer for himself, because we're, we're not conducting a full clinical uh, consultation here this evening, but Conrad's got to answer for himself is just why does he believe that those needles in the skin got him better? And does he not accept and doesn't the rest of the audience not accept that this business of causation? I think that's uh, extremely important. So the first thing in Conrad is how do you know the diagnosis? Who made the diagnosis and what was it really? But good luck to you. I just hope that you stay better and that terrible trap nerve doesn't come back. On a technicality here, it wasn't Conrad. Who, oh, right. who, who was that? It's Facebook user. We don't know this person's name. Oh, I do apologise. I'm getting confused between the... Um, okay, there he is. That chat there. This this person has given us a link on spurious correlations, which I will add underneath the uh, the, the video when it's a, when it turns into a podcast. Now I'm not sure whether you got through all of your stuff, Max. Do, did you have uh, other questions that you um, want? I'm happy to um, go through any other things which I find interesting in that, Edzard, you are clearly considered to be the scourge of complementary medicine. I've seen you cited as that. And certainly amongst um, some various groups I know where there are a lot of complementary medicine people in it, your name is, to put it politely, mud. Um, I suppose my question is, given that you've had to put up with a lot of flack over the years, you know, we mentioned earlier, even before you started your work in complementary medicine, how do you manage the kind of level of antagonism that you are subject to? Well, in my case, I, I had to convert to uh, becoming a masochist. <laughs> That's a straightforward answer. You just have to take it and let it wash over you. I, I started collecting uh, uh, death threats, uh, uh, insults, and things. I, I have files full. Uh, at, at one stage, I, I thought I, I'd publish a humorous book about it. Uh, maybe I, st I, I still still do that. Uh, I'd, nowadays, on, on my blog, I take it as a compliment when somebody says I'm, I'm an idiot because invariably the one who says I'm an idiot is a bigger idiot than I could ever thrive to be. <laughs> okay, well, that's a very, um, a very sensible way of managing what must be quite distressing to you at times. And I suppose my well, other... What was distressing was when, when we had the police to, in to my office explaining to my secretaries how a letter bomb would smell. Uh, because we had threats in that direction. 
apparently uh, if you want to know they smell like marzipan a little bit wow. so I, 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 I had my secretary smelling uh, suspicious letters uh, and and that's where it stops being all that funny yes indeed getting serious and could put you off Christmas cake as well <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> How awful. And I suppose, my other, of course, there is still um, a move towards complementary medicine and is sc being squeezed out of the NHS. But certainly there have been times when even NICE approved of complementary medicine in various treatments, including back pain. I suppose my question is, what's the best way of managing the pressure towards the use of complementary medicine within, if you like, the structures of society rather than on an individual basis? For the benefit of our audience, Max talked about NICE. That's the National Institute of Clinical Excellence. Mm -hmm. Indeed. And there was a time when its guidance, particularly on back pain, um, did talk about the use of various forms of, co of complementary medicine. Um, and, you know, yeah, and we were also not quite sure what's happened to the homeopathic hospital in Bristol, but that certainly when I was working in Bristol, that was still running. And um, it was no, it's, very... It's it's finished. It's a I'm private. Yeah. It's it's a private institute now. It's it's over. Glad to hear it. We um... there, there, is, there is no more homeopathic hospital in 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 the UK. Okay, which is good news. Then, see, at the time, the argument was actually that the political pressure, particularly from you know Prince Charles and Co., was when it was to take up more time and money than the actual cost of investing in the homeopathic hospital. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure that this sort of pressure uh, exists uh, and existed. And uh, as as Richard mentioned, he he recently became the patron of the uh, faculty of homeopathy, so it still exists. Uh, but it wasn't it wasn't strong enough to prevent uh, rationality happening after all. After at, a very long time. I'm, I'm optimist. Uh, evidence cannot be swept under the carpet. Evidence is evidence. Facts are facts. And eventually they will win Charles or no Charles. Let's have Richard on now. Let's, let's... I just wanted to comment on the Bristol situation. I think what is important, and I'm sure we're all delighted, is that it was a matter not exactly of a, of a plebiscite uh, or a referendum, but the local public were asked to contribute to a review, an independent review held by the health authority. And the health authority officials uh, took a lot of cognizance of local opinion. And although there was undoubtedly a great lobbying uh, in support of uh, having homeopathy on the NHS at Bristol, the fact of the matter is the majority of Bristolians felt they could spend their money in better ways. And that was one of the major factors in the decision to close the hospital. I find it quite amusing that uh, people can vote for this. I, I imagine a, a vote on, on the NHS uh, uh, where patients in, in hospital are, uh, can vote for a glass of champagne every morning. Uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, to me, medicine is not what patients want, but what patients need. Well, they used to get a, a, a bottle of Guinness at night in the uh, maternity yeah. wards. And, yeah. Yep. And, and I've certainly prescribed, when I was a houseman, I was working on cancer wards, and I, and I was allowed to prescribe uh, a whiskey or sherry, 10 mils. It was a formal uh, prescription on the prescription card, on the note, and the nurse would dispense it from the drugs trolley it's Very it's well, you see, it's actually you know you, you you're dying of cancer or patients uh, actually, actually to be perfectly fair most of the ones that i was caring for did reasonably well and went home they may have had uh, terminal illness later but um, these they needed support and that's why we're coming back around to the circle uh, i support placebo they needed a little tlc love and attention and yeah, if we gave them 10 mils of sherry, why not? But did it actually do anything to cure their sad cancer disease? Well, no, of course not. But it made them feel better. And that's that's part of medicine. Medicine is more complex than just treating diseases, as I'm, I'm sure we all recognize. Exactly. I'm, I'm totally with you there. 
but uh, your your patients also got proper medication in uh, in addition to the, to the, to the whiskey. Okay. If yeah. if you only had given them whiskey, you would be a charlatan. Yes. The, this is the the tip of the iceberg of the horrendous side of complementary and alternative medicine, isn't it? Because the mother of one of my daughter's school chums recently contracted cancer and she came upon this cure that involved flying to uh, Brazil, somewhere in that part of the world. Mexico, usually. Mexico. Yes, so she flew off, came back, said, I'm completely cured. And a few months later, she had to fly off again and spend more money and came back thinking that she was cured. And of course, now she's dead, very sadly. Yeah. Prince Charles uh, seems to feature uh, a lot in our conversation. He he was the one who who uh, promoted uh, that in a, in a talk to uh, uh, to gynecologists as, at the Royal College of Gyne Gynecologists. I, I was present. He he said the the, the Gerson treated treatment uh, needs needs looking at because he knows somebody who was completely cured of of cancer through the Gerson. Uh, yeah. approach and and uh, th that's created quite a bit of a stir uh, and particularly as as Gerson treatment is one of the worst it's a it's a starvation diet yeah. which makes you uh, not only die but die more miserably yes well this happened last year and at, at a very similar time somebody I can't remember it was a, a woman published a book about this very thing that you probably know the, the book I'm referring to about charlatans and fake medicine that just make the only thing they achieve is to make the purveyor rich and I bought this book and I gave it to this mother and uh, she dismissed it she was convinced that she had the right solution it's very tragic when 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 this happens. Uh, Indeed. So we have another question here, which is about a. I, I I did write to Prince Charles and I asked him for the evidence that he had that uh, homeopathy had benefit because this is very important. And I said, look, we really must know. We, the community, the world, must know of this evidence that you've got. And I got a reply almost by return from his private secretary on beautiful, nice, thick stationary paper uh, saying that the prince doesn't enter into correspondence on this matter which is a damn shame because he is a fellow of the royal society and he's the patron of numerous other medical organizations and has been president of the bma in the past they only do one year and he really does have a responsibility to tell the public what is the evidence that he's got because if he hasn't got any he's also got to tell the public that and for him not to do so makes him the charlatan so here we have charles le charlatan <laughs> He, he never enters into discussions, which is so, so it's annoying. A, if you enter the public domain on a topic, you have an absolute moral responsibility to discuss it properly. Not just, not just ex cathedra, it seems to me, waggle of ears, waggle of ears. That will not do. He is going to be sovereign of this country very probably one day, and he really ought to have more responsibility and act more responsibly. If he wants to enter the public domain, if he has private beliefs about his God or about his method of worship or whether he wants to be a defender of all the faiths or the subtleties of Henry VIII's accommodation with the Pope at the time, or all this sort of business, Business, that's fine that's for his personal conscience and good luck to him with that but if he enters the public domain in areas of healthcare, he should engage with the public and not to do so is morally reprehensible yes i've remembered who made that quote uh, to the effect that uh, you're the most easy person to fool yourself richard feynman that's the one yes now there's a side effect isn't there to TCM, rhino horn, oh. extinction, uh, pangolins, more extinction. 
if not yeah. bad, is. It, that, that is a, a, another rather tragic aspect of of uh, uh, alternative medicine. That in in TCM uh, they use animal parts um, mm -hmm. and animal parts of uh, endangered species. Uh, not only do these animal parts do absolutely nothing. They, they they don't benefit. There's no 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 proof at all that they uh, uh, cause any benefit, but they cause a lot of harm, particularly to the endangered species. Yes, and there's there's uh, uh, there are many big in initiatives to stop that, but uh, wh whenever. It, it is officially stopped, then the trade becomes illegal and, and the prices go up and the demand gets even more fierce. So uh, it, is, it is a real tragedy, uh, that particular aspect. Yes, well, I, I think this has been a very enlightening little uh, encounter. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. And uh, we're coming to the end of our time now. So I'm just going to thank you guys very much for coming on, and particularly our two old friends who've been on before. <laughs> I'm trying to, trying to point at you, <laughs> not succeeding. And uh, uh, thank you very much, Ed, sir. Ed, sir, out for being our star, uh, our star uh, guest. <laughs> so wonderful. Thank you very much. Now, next week, to our viewers, we have the the return of um, oh, I'm not going to be able to think of his name now. The subject is transhumanism, and it's our friend who was on last week. Back again. So look forward to that. Eight o'clock Wednesday next week. Cheerio. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.